we've talked about effectiveness, we've talked about the fact that the evidence is asymmetrical, people have different uh, access to evidence, and we've talked about that. There are principles of cooperation under Article 4.3 of the basic treaty of the European Union, not even the treaty on the functioning of the European Union. This cooperation is fundamental to how Europe operates. Now, the first point is rather important. As judges, frankly, we are never going to have the full picture. What we're looking at is always going to be partial. And so the way in which we deal with this has got to be proportionate. And that's why uh, courts have to be empowered to estimate. There is never going to be an absolutely right arithmetical answer. At the end of the day, the job of the judge is to decide. And at the end of the day, the reason why it is 457,000 euro is because the judge says so. There is this rebuttable presumption of harm from cartels, and when it comes to the abuse of a dominant position, the very fact that you have found an abuse suggests that there has been an abuse. What that abuse is, of course, you've got to decide. The Commission provides guidance, and we'll come on to that, and the directive provides for the court to get help from the National Competition Authority. So what are we looking at? What are we trying to quantify? Well, we're trying to quantify actual loss, loss of profit, and interest. And what's envisaged uh, in the Commission guidance is that there are going to be further developments, and we'll come back to those in a moment. What is not envisaged is what is allowed in English law, as Liam explained, which is exemplary damages, that if the behavior was so bad that it ought to be punished, then the person who brings the case gets rewarded for doing that by being overcompensated, and that is going to be illegal under the directive. And one of the things that Ireland and uh, the United Kingdom have to decide is how we deal with that when it's a matter of national law. These basic principles run right the way through what we're doing. So what happens must not be practically impossible or excessively difficult. The claimant must have the possibility of getting those damages estimated. We talked about limitation. So, causation. There has to be a connection between the infringement and the loss. Now that may seem absolutely obvious, but it's rather important, and fortunately courts are very used to having to look at causation, and there's no great difference between causation in this case and causation in other cases. So, I'm not going to say very much about causation, except that in assessing it, Again, the task must not be made impossible for the claimant. So keep those basic principles going round and round. Proof has got to be not impossible. That's helped by having a rebuttable presumption that cartels cause harm, and there were some who thought that there should have been a percentage in there. As one of my economist friends says, it's really not worth founding a cartel for 10%, the, the minimum we really ought to have for a cartel is 20%. You know, if we're going to get together to, to, uh, to reach an agreement on court fees, for example, I'm, we, we, we'd want to make sure that they're uh, pretty unreasonable in the sense that we get a decent margin.
they decided not to put a percentage in. So the statement is qualitative that harm happens. And that's going to leave room for lots of economists to argue about what the appropriate percentage should be. And again, one can get help from a national competition authority. Now, the Commission have provided a communication. And one of the interesting things as we talk about this uh, subject is the status of soft law. As you go through my slides, you'll find that I'm referring to recitals as well as to articles and to the Commission communication on quantification and to the practical document that accompanied the communication. Now, recitals and the Commission communication and the practical guide are all soft law. They don't bind a court. And one of the questions that people are asking is, as we start taking decisions which reflect the recitals and reflect the soft law in the Commission guidance, will case law harden some of those bits of soft law into harder law because they have been embodied in case law? And I have to tell you that some judges are worried about this. The Commission itself has tried to say that their guidance does not, uh, is not the end of the story. But inevitably, as this subject develops, so lawyers will be trying to persuade us that previous cases should be applied as hard law and not simply as soft law. And that's going to be one of the issues that arises as we go along. And some of these things will be the subject of preliminary questions to Luxembourg, and we shall begin to get guidance from Luxembourg as to how to treat these matters. Now, the fundamental question is, where would a party have been if the infringement had not taken place? In other words, how do we put the party into the position that they would have been had the infringement not happened? And this is an estimated scenario, and inevitably there is a limit to the certainty and precision with which uh, one can uh, do that estimation. So the judges are, are put in the position, it's not guesswork. It's educated guesswork. But that's what we're doing. We're making an estimated scenario. And we're doing so proportionally on the basis of economic insights and in some cases particular methods and techniques. Now, many years ago now, I chaired on behalf of the European Commission a group of authorities from the member states to try to convince them that you could make into arithmetic a number of algebraic models in the field of telecommunications. And this was to derive the regulated prices for telecommunications. Now I have to tell you that I thought then we got it slightly wrong and I think we haven't got it quite right yet. And what that tells you is that some of these methods are in themselves questionable. And when you have lots of economists in court, they will be telling you that their method is right and the other people's method is wrong. Now, in one of my recent cases, I asked each of the witnesses in turn, did you engage in quantitative modeling of your own pricing? Only one witness amongst our leading supermarkets were actually engaged in quantitative modelling of their own prices. So you've got on the one hand a, section, a collection of economists doing these quantitative models, and on the other hand, industries 
not doing quantitative models. So you have to ask yourself, what, how is this behavior being conditioned? And what techniques are appropriate? And the fact that an economist suggests a technique to you should not necessarily convince you that that technique is applicable. And what the Commission communication talks about is evolving economic insights based on three things. Theoretical and empirical research, they are different, and judicial practice. Now that acknowledgement of judicial practice is actually very interesting because what it is suggesting is that as we go forward, the judges will themselves gain experience in how to do these estimations and that we should be ready to listen to judicial experience. So, accompanying the commission document, which is very short, comes a heavy practical guide. And the practical guide uh, contains a, a number of um, ways forward. The first is comparator-based methods, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. The second is regression analyses. Now, I probably ought to stop and say, what is a variable of interest? It, it's not interest in the sense of what you have to pay for your mortgage or what you're getting from your bank, which is probably now nothing. It's, it may be prices. So one of the variables in a regression analysis is the price of the good or service we're looking at. Now, there may be other variables of interest, such as the season, or uh, the price of oil, or a tax rate. And what you're trying to do in a regression analysis is to understand the influence of the variable of interest, in my example, price, in determining what happens. Example, what is the elasticity of demand for a bus service. Jean-Louis runs a bus service and he charges one euro for his bus service. Enter Mirella who starts a rival bus service and she is going to charge 50 cents. What is the elasticity of demand between Jean-Louis' buses and Mirella's buses? Will I, for 50 pence, get on the first bus that comes along or wait and see whose bus it is? Now, you can model that in theory. You can do empirical studies on that. You can stand at a bus stop and see how many people get on the first bus that arrive and how many people wait for the cheaper bus. At the same time, you can analyze the costs. You can see whether Morella's bus service is actually engaged in predatory pricing by examining her costs against her price. Now, these are mathematical exercises. You can have discussions about which costs should be included when determining predatory pricing, uh, or you may be examining whether Jean-Louis is extorting money out of the passengers, that actually 50 cents is the proper price, and a whole euro is an extortionate price, and he's misusing his dominant position despite the fact that there is a competitive offering. And all of those are matters that could be discussed. And you could do analyses on those. You can do modeling, you can do simulations of what would happen if both buses were at 50 cents or both buses were at uh, a euro. What would happen to the behavior of the passengers? 
Now, there are various particular uh, points here which have to do with what happens when you have a chain of people so that, for example, if the price of petrol is, let us say, one euro a litre and now moves up to 1.5 litres per euro, what is the effect of that downstream? Lots of people are affected by that change. Prices in the supermarket may go up because it applies to everybody. So if you've got a supermarket who are claiming that the petrol companies have all got together and raised the price of petrol by 50 cents a litre, the question is, did they suffer that loss or did they pass the whole loss through to their customers? That's passing on. Now, at the moment, I'm not going to go into the details of this case, but we have a supermarket before us in a seven-week trial suing MasterCard. And one of the questions is, what are the effects? Now, the supermarket can argue that even though they passed on the costs of the rise in petrol prices, the fact that all their prices went up had a volume effect on their total sales. Now, that then depends upon the elasticity. The, def the defendants may say that people are so wholly dependent on food from the supermarkets that actually demand on the supermarkets did not fall down at all. What happened was people went out to the theatre less. They didn't redecorate their homes. And actually, no, there was no effect. But you have to consider what is the, the volume effect. Um, they also, in, in the practical guide, deal with what happens when there is exclusion. Now, exclusion can happen in a variety of ways. We had a case which had to do with a crematorium in a small town. There were two family firms of funeral directors who used the crematorium. One family owned the crematorium. In a Romeo and Juliet type situation, the families fell out. And the family who owned the crematorium refused to burn the bodies of the customers of the other family. And they complained to the National Competition Authority who didn't do anything about it. So they came to us first in public law and then in private law. And we held abuse of a dominant position in public law, and then there was a private action to follow. And there you had exclusionary behavior. We said that the fact that there are other crematoria in Britain did not matter because you would have to drive the body a long way to the next crematorium. And so there you had an instance of exclusionary behavior. And the practical guide helps you to understand the impact on competitors and on customers. So back to comparators. How do we look for comparators? Well, you can look at what happens over time in the same market. Let me give you an example, uh, which is about to be current in the United Kingdom. London has a variety of airports. It only has one airport close to the centre of town, London City Airport. The owners of London City Airport wish to sell it for a lot of money. If they sell it for a lot of money, the debt associated with the airport is likely to increase significantly. And the worry that British Airways have this time, British Airways is uh, the complainant, not the defendant, is that 
the price of landing and taking off from the airport will increase significantly on the basis that the costs have gone up due to the takeover, raising the costs of debt. So that's going to raise questions about, is this airport in a dominant position? Or does the fact that we have Heathrow, Gatwick, Luton and Stansted, not to mention Schiphol and Charles de Gaulle, in easy reach, you know, what's going on here? So, but you can look at what happens to those prices in the same market over time and ask yourself, is this behavior anti-competitive? Then you can have data from other geographic markets. You can ask yourself the question, how do the landing costs at London City Airport compare to other airports, other geographic markets? You can also use data from other product markets. <coughs> so if you take an example uh, from the dairy industry, you have cheese, butter, ordinary milk, yogurts. And if when you look at the price of cheese, something very different is happening to the price of cheese to what is happening to the price of milk, then something funny is going on. Um, actually, geographic market, we had an example in the UK where uh, the price of milk in Scotland was significantly higher than the price of milk in England. And it turned out that what had happened was that Robert Wiseman, big milk company in Scotland, had divided Scotland into two zones. And I think it was Express Dairies had one part of Scotland and Robert Wiseman had the other part of Scotland. So they divided the geographic market. But you could tell that something funny was going on because the price of milk in Scotland was peculiarly high. And why wasn't this being evened out if there was a truly competitive market? So other product markets, geographic markets, time. Uh, you can also look, of course, at a combination of time and across markets. So taking the milk example again, if the price of milk was going up like that in England, but like that in Scotland, then that suggests to you that something untoward is happening. And it's not difficult then to ask the question, is this is there a good reason for this, or is the reason for this the anti-competitive behavior? Now, you do have to ask yourself that question, because sometimes there will be a good reason for it. We had uh, a head of our National Competition Authority who was told by our government to investigate why the price of petrol in the United Kingdom was higher than anywhere else in Europe. And the government wanted the answer because of the wicked large companies selling petrol. Instead, he came back and said, I can tell you the answer. It's very simple. The taxes in the United Kingdom are higher than anywhere else in Europe. That is the answer. The government's reaction to that was to allow him to spend more time with his family. This is not a good solution. So you do, as a court, have to ask yourself the question, is there another reason why your comparator is turning out the way it's turning out? So comparators can be good and comparators can be bad. Counterfactuals. If you can't find a useful comparator, then you have to fall back on what would have happened if there had been no infringement. And can you work out what would have happened? In the bus case, we had one bus company 
which decided that in order to compete, it would run buses free. Its idea being that it would drive the incumbent carrier out of business, and they took various other steps. And so you have to ask yourself, what's the kind of factor? Now, we had a bus case, and the defendant argued that this company was so badly run, the claimant company, that they would have become insolvent anyway. And that's, that's quite difficult. You, you've got to work out what, what's really going on here. Now, one of the problems about competition law can be insolvency. Some of you I know deal with insolvency. And if you are a clever defendant group, one of your tactics can be to render the defendant company insolvent. But sometimes it's the claimant company that's insolvent. On a number of occasions, we have had an insolvent claimant company in front of us saying that it was because of the behavior of the infringer that they have gone out of business. Now, in a situation like that, you, you've got to ask yourself, what scenario techniques do you use and what are your plausibility tests? Now let's talk for a moment about scenarios. In the real world, life is horrendously complicated. In building a scenario, you generally limit the number of variables you are going to change. I will give you an example. Jacob Marshak was an economist who was asked by the US Navy who hadn't got any nuclear weapons at the time, to investigate the scenarios of nuclear war. And Marshak had a two-by-two two matrix. On one side, he has, there isn't a nuclear war, and there is a nuclear war. And on the other side, he had, we built shelters, and we didn't build shelters. This is in the United States. And into the boxes, he put the results, all dead, all still alive, rich and poor. And that was because Marshak reckoned that to build shelters for the whole population of the United States was going to cost the United States a great deal of money. Switzerland was doing so, but rather different situation. And so you had the very simple situation in the Marshak matrix uh, with just those four boxes. Now, other scenario analysis becomes slightly more complicated, and what is likely to happen if you are in a contested procedure is that each side will have a rival scenario. And in the case that I'm thinking about, the defendants are likely to say, whatever happens, this claimant company would have been insolvent. The claimant company is going to say, we would have been thriving in one scenario, but in fact, we were insolvent. And so you, you have to ask yourself, what are the underlying variables that you're going to put into the mix in terms of your scenario? Now, scenarios are stories. And each of us in this room have been judging the plausibility of stories since we were quite small children. Psychologists tell us that from a quite an early age, you were able to tell whether the story that mummy or daddy were telling you was plausible or not. And that's the judgment that as a judge you've got to exercise. Is the story that I'm being told by this party a plausible story or an implausible story because there's no proof of a counterfactual. It is necessarily hypothetical. Now, 
you may be able to use actual comparators. There may be other examples that enable you to tell whether this is a plausible story or not. But that is, in essence, the task. So, the passing on defense. In many of the cases with which we deal, there is a chain of people from suppliers down through wholesalers, retailers, and then the ultimate customer. I was myself part of the class action against British Airways in California in relation to the fuel surcharge for passengers. It's not the freight one I talked about uh, this morning. Now, when I claimed my damages, I was told I couldn't because they had already been claimed by my travel agent. Now, my travel agent, I have to tell you, had passed on the entire fuel surcharge to me. And in terms of a passing on defense, they had no loss on a price basis. They could have a loss on a quantity basis in that they could argue that they would have had more business had there not been a fuel surcharge. You'll be glad to know that I recovered my loss from the travel agent. I imagine they made a great deal of money from people who failed to recover their money from the travel agent. So you've got this question of who has what burdens in the passing on defense. So if it's a direct purchaser, it is the defendant who must prove that the passing on took place. So in my example, British Airways would have to prove that the travel agent passed on the charge. Now, if we go back to evidence, what evidence do they need? Answer, sometimes uh, that's very straightforward. They get the papers out of the travel agent and they can see fuel surcharge on the paperwork. So if you're a travel agent, remember, don't separately list the fuel surcharge. Otherwise, you're, you'll be in big trouble when there's disclosure of your documentation. Life becomes a little more complicated if you are the indirect purchaser. And you'll have to consider uh, what happens. And uh, I'm not going to go into all the detail. What you need to do is when there's a passing on defense, alarm bells should ring in your mind. And you've got to remind yourself where in the directive has the burden got to. See, the basic burden for proving infringement is with the claimant. But here we've got two instances so far where the burden shifts. First, with the cartel, there is a presumption of harm. It's rebuttable. And secondly, uh, where you've got passing on, then the burden has switched to the defendant. Again, estimation applies. And so if the travel agent is able to say, well, I felt I would lose all my business if I passed on the whole fuel surcharge, so I only passed on half of it, then you, as a judge, are going to have to work out what actually happened and make an estimate. So here you have multi-level claims. Now, This is where life begins to become um, complicated. Courts ha have got to work out what is going on in what is likely to be a series of actions which may well be taking place before more than one court. The Americans are very used to these antitrust cases starting in several courts and they have procedures for consolidating cases. But we've already seen today that you can have multiple claimants, 
claimants can be direct purchasers, intermediary purchasers, consumers. And later we'll talk about consumers and collective actions. You've got multiple defendants. And amongst the multiple defendants, in an undertaking, you can have parent companies, subsidiaries, and of course siblings. And courts have got to try to ensure that judgments are consistent, and consistent not only within private actions, but also within public enforcement. And one aspect of this is understanding what has the public authority done. Now, in some cases, a public authority as part of a settlement may agree a compensation program. And again, courts need to be aware, just in case the answer has already been decided by a competition authority somewhere. Or by another court. Now, again, you've got the problem of knowing when is it the same infringement and when is it a related infringement. In my carbon case, you had infringement of American law being litigated in America, but the same cartel giving rise to an infringement of European law being litigated, in our case, in the United Kingdom. So these multi-level claims require quite a lot of attention, and parties, and indeed you, need to get some idea of who has what money where. So estimation. Courts have to be empowered to estimate. And this is where you need a mixture, frankly, of competence and confidence. As a judge, you or your, your group of judges are going to have to take a punt. You're going to have to say it's 457,000 euro. I would advise against 47, 457, 263 and four cents. Because that suggests that you are cleverer than you are. So I would, I would advise round numbers which acknowledge that you're having to do a, a, an estimation. So we're beginning to work out estimated damage, but who's going to pay? Now, I've already heard today that there's joint and several liability, but joint and several liability is subject to some restrictions. As you've heard, an SME has restrictions unless they are the lead player in a cartel. Now, in some countries, you may have, as we have in the UK, a special procedure. We have a fast-track procedure for SMEs, and that has a number of special provisions. It's based, it, it comes out to a very strange number in, well, the numbers for turnover and capitalization are very odd in sterling because they're expressed in euro in the uh, European recommendation that has to be translated. Relative responsibility is a matter of national law. It's a matter of subsidiarity. And national courts should be used to working out amongst defendants who should be paying what. Now, one of the things that the damages directive does recognize is that along the way, some of the parties may become insolvent and that that may change the way in which the liabilities land. So a leniency immunity uh, company may become liable because everybody else has run out of money. And that's why it's important to know where the money is. <laughs> and um, I'm not sure whether I should say more about that, but but there is a problem in groups of companies in that they may move the money around to try to ensure that at the end of the day, the defendant companies are insolvent. Now that then leads you on to whether that is a lawful 
way of handling legal personality or whether it's fraudulent. And there may be cases where you have to refer to your fraud authority rather than try and deal with it yourself because some people do engage in fraudulent conduct. It doesn't help the plaintiff. No, it doesn't help the plaintiff. No, alas, it doesn't help the plaintiff. There, there may be circumstances in which it could help the plaintiff, but it doesn't normally. Is there any way you can get at the directors, the officers? And in public law in the UK, we have director's disqualification provision in our competition law, not often used. Um, I mean, I, I believe this is a real problem. It has only occasionally arisen. Um, we had a case which one of the problems was companies change their names quite often when they're doing this sort of thing. Um, it, one of its names was the Sepia Logistics case. And this was a company that knew that a decision was about to emanate from the competition authority that would render them liable. And what they did, it was quite clever this, the, the company employed the children of the chairman and they sold the business, not the legal entity, they sold the business out of the legal entity to a listed company who omitted to inform the stock exchange or the competition authority of the transaction. So the decision arrived addressed to a company which was by then such a shell that its finance director in the witness box was unable to explain to me where the money was. The chairman of the company, whose children had been sold, as it were, with the company, with the business, uh, appeared in court, but not in the witness box, and he was always placed so there was a lawyer hiding his face from me. And in the end, I was rather firm in court with him about one or two of the facts of this case. Uh, I mean, he had been in the room when the infringement, infringing activities took place. They drove a competitor out of business, amongst other things. Um, and we did the holding company. But, but How did you oh, fortunately, they were an addressee too. Okay. So that was direct liability. That was direct liability on the holding company. I mean, they tried to argue that it wasn't. One of my favorite cases about this was the Axo Nobel case, where uh, Axo Nobel took over a, a British company, and they ran full-page advertisements in the Wall Street Journal explaining what a wonderfully integrated, synergistic group this now was. And then they found themselves arguing in court that the whole group was so dysfunctional that the, they, the holding company could not be held responsible for the actions of a subsidiary company. And they pulled all the advertising quickly. And th this is, the European Commission is actually quite worried about this whole business of liability. Uh, because most of our legal systems have not really grappled with the realities of how business works today. And that's problematic. When you're thinking about relative responsibility under national law, you've got to respect effectiveness and equivalence. One of the provisions that we have in our law is that we can um, order a payment on account. And so we... Before any finding. Before any finding. And we have done this on one occasion. It did result in a rapid settlement when, when the parties realized that we were concerned about this. Um, that, that this is very much a matter of what is available in your national law in terms of um, whether you can make an interim order, either in relation to an injunctive remedy or in relation to some payment, uh, and we also have the concept of payment in. So if Liam and I are litigating, Liam can pay two million in, which the court doesn't know about. Now, if I recover less than two million, then I'm responsible for the costs, 
And if I recover more than two million, then he's responsible for the cost. This is very much a matter of national law, what you are able to do. And it's the same with costs. Uh, we have a system of security for costs where if one party is concerned that the other party is what we call a person of straw or maybe about to shell out the company, in other words, to, to remove all the money, then we, we can ask for security for costs to be, to be uh, put in place. So, but this is, this is very much a matter of, of the remedies that are available through your national system. Now, what's important here is my, my fourth point, respecting effectiveness and equivalence. In other words, you, you, you must use your national law, that's the equivalence part, but what you do must be effective. And there are special considerations for immunity recipients uh, when it comes to contribution. Contribution is this business of sorting out between the parties what happens. Now, what may happen is that the claimants decide to go against one of the members of the cartel and to leave that member of the cartel to bring in third parties who are the other members of the cartel. They may also choose to leave them out and then the other parties may have to decide whether they want to, to intervene in the proceedings to protect their own position. And again, this will be a matter in your national law for how do you deal with parties who are not defendants at the first level. Um, as I've explained, the case I've talked about, we've got third parties and fourth parties uh, and non-parties. So these are all things that you have to think about in the contribution part of an action. Interest. The directive is very straightforward. It just says interest is recoverable, basically. That's what it says. It doesn't tell you the rate of interest. Um, this is down to national law again. You're going to have to work out what is the, the proper rate of interest, bearing in mind full compensation. And that may depend on the party. Um, if it's a long case, interest can be a very large component. If interest rates go up again, uh, interest can make an enormous difference to the overall total of the damages. So, again, it's a question of national law and that principle of effectiveness, that you, we are trying to give the parties a full compensation. That brings us to a slide which says consensual resolution. So, you worked out what you're going to do and you made a judgment. You then get into enforcement. Now, enforcement is going to take you into, if it's a, a multinational case, uh, it's going to take you into the Brussels regulation. You may have to pursue uh, people overseas and you've got to follow that through. You've also got to remember to inform the Commission. This is under Regulation 1 of 2003. The, the Damages Directive doesn't have to tell you that. Um, you, you need to inform the Commission. Now, there is a point here that we need to go back to. And we really haven't worked this out yet. As a court, under Regulation 1 of 2003, there's a responsibility to apply Article 101 and 102 where the infringement has an effect on trade between member states. And this raises the issue of what happens if the parties have brought the case before you on the basis of national competition law and it is apparent to you that there is an effect on trade between member states. Now, I don't know, in Ireland, if you have a case like that, so it's been brought under national law, there's a clear effect on trade between member states, what is the responsibility of the court? And the court um, must consider the direct application of 101 or 102. So, there is no discretion in relation to it. It must move of its own motion yeah. to a court. 
this is again, it's about the alarm bells ringing. You, you've got a case in front of you, you look at it, you say, clear effect on trade between member states, or is there an effect between, on trade between member states? What do I do about it? Answer, I've got to apply the law, European law. Now, one of the reasons why in some member states you'll see very few cases on the Commission list is because quite often people do not bring either public law or private law actions under European law. They bring it under national law. And part of what is meant to be happening is that courts need to ask themselves the question, has this been properly framed? Is this the appropriate law under which to bring the action? Now, you've got some interesting interactions here because the law, for example, on limitation may be different depending on whether the action is brought under European law or national law. And so the task for the judge may be more complicated than it looks at first instance. But uh, we are hoping that the Commission website is going to be well populated. Now, the Commission is asking itself the question, how to deal with this database? Because the current arrangements uh, are probably inadequate for the increase in cases that the Commission is hoping is going to occur once the damages directive is in force. Then the question of costs. Now, here we are in an area where national law uh, is very important. You will have your own background in how costs are awarded and how costs are assessed. But there is the question of proportionality. And part of what we're talking about is how a case is managed in a way that is proportional. And one way of doing that is at a fairly early stage to try to appreciate how is this case going to be run proportionally. We, we've had damages action in which the costs have been an order of magnitude larger than the damages. Now, that is disproportionate. Now, you will have in your own procedural law, how do you deal with that? In some systems, in our, in our High Court, we now have the possibility of a cost budget, of, of getting the parties to, to produce a budget of what they think should be spent. We can do cost capping. We can say that whatever Liam spends, he can only recover 25,000. So he can employ enormously expensive lawyers, but if he wins, he can only recover 25,000 or whatever it is. But to think about the costs on the last day is not the answer. We need to be thinking about the costs of each case much earlier on if we are to keep them proportional. Here we are with effectiveness and equivalence. And part of the, the implication that damages directive is in substantive law and part of it is the changes in national rules of procedure that will be necessary to make it effective and equivalent and to ensure that it's not difficult or practically impossible. <coughs> I don't know how far you as judges are being involved by your government and legislature in the transposition. I know the amount of effort it has taken us to change our rules and our guide to procedure uh, to develop as far as we have in relation to private actions. And we put a lot of work into this. And that's because we want a guide that actually helps lawyers and litigants in person to understand how we do this. Uh, we'll come on to collective in a moment.
There's also sincere cooperation. cooperation. And part of this is between public and private enforcement. Again, bells have got to ring in your mind. Do, are you going to have a procedure which automatically copies each claim to the National Competition Authority? Copies it to them for two reasons. First, are they already engaged in public enforcement, or do they want to investigate? In which case, do they want you to stay proceedings while they do so? And secondly, do you want their help? So, at both EU and national levels, we need to be aware of what is going on in each other's proceedings. We may also need to be aware of what is going on in parallel proceedings in other member states, and we may have uh, a claim brought in member state one with an investigation taking place in member state two. You may well have claims brought in member states one, two, and three with investigations taking place in member states four, five, and six. And how we work out some of this is going to be one of the nice, interesting questions. But we are worried, uh, so we're talking to Eddie Schmeiter. Eddie Schmeiter is now both handling private enforcement in DGCOP and also the ECA. So he's looking both at relations between the Commission and the National Competition Authorities and the relations between the Commission and the courts. And my advice is that the courts need to talk to the National Competition Authority because uh, National Competition Authorities as well as courts need to be geared up, ready to know how to deal with this. Now those discussions are maybe difficult where you're also the court that does appeals from the National Competition Authority. And we are wondering whether we have to make those discussions on the record, make transcripts of everything that is said, so that it is clear to people that we are not talking behind anybody's back and that we are open about what we're doing. So we do see some difficulties. Disclosure and limits. You've already learned that the National Competition Authority will have to work with you in understanding the rules and the practicalities of disclosure. And as I say, deciding whether you should stay your proceedings while public enforcement takes place. So, getting and being given help. How can we help each other? Well, as I say, we can identify questions of practical importance. Areas where we're not quite sure what we're going to do, and where we think some discussion or guidance may be necessary. We can begin to develop best practices. And I think we'll, we'll, we will learn from each other as time goes by. Uh, and I'm trying to enable discussions between the judiciary and the commission to help us do that. We need to identify what are the hazards, what are, what are the trip bars, what are the things that are going to go wrong as we try and do all this. Uh, many of which we won't know until we start trying. And as I say, informing the Commission of areas where guidance could be improved. 